Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jemek, for giving us your time today. And I'm delighted to introduce, introduce Ms. Jemek, who's a consultant and plastic and reconstructive hand surgeon, um, and also the founding chairman for Be First, which is the British Foundation for International Reconstructive Surgery and Training, and the official overseas charity for back breast. She's currently a practicing hand surgeon in Toronto, Canada, and has extensive experience of overseas work and training in, re in reconstructive surgery in countries like Ghana, Bolivia, and Bangladesh, helping to treat patients in need. She has previously been a council member of the British Society of Surgery of the Hands, Back Press, and also the, the plastic surgery president um, for the plastic surgery section of the RSM. She's now a board member for the Canadian Society for the Surgery of the Hand, and we're grateful that she's been um, given us her time today to speak. Um, so I'll hand over to Anine to ask the first question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your time. So we're going to start off with, tell me about your overseas experience to date. Okay, I think it's best described as it's crystallized for me everything that's important about interpersonal relationships. Okay, how important it is to keep to your word, how important it is to be a good friend, how important it is to try and walk in somebody else's shoes and to not judge and but look at things with open and new eyes uh, to try and help um, that the help that you want to give is received amazingly graciously uh, and that the welcoming uh, environment that you are in is also fantastic. Uh, it is... That's what has. That's what my overseas experience is. This is apart from the clinical side, obviously, but I think that's one of the main, the key things to take home. We need to be good friends. And how did you first get involved in overseas work? What inspired you to get involved in this area? So I went to high school with another uh, a girl. I had a girlfriend uh, in high school that also went to, to go into overseas, and she started much earlier than me which is interesting because that will lead on to one of your other questions. So she showed me that the earlier you start, the less you do what you think you're going to be doing. So she went out as a medical student and worked as a logistician or as a nurse and organizer, admin, all sorts of things, anything but a doctor. Um, so uh, when I first started going out, I went out with uh, Mr. Martin Webster, who has a longstanding um, project in Ghana. And that was fantastic. So A, I went out with my own mentor. I had somebody to debrief with in the evenings. I had a unit who was used to people coming. So they were welcoming. They were they nurtured me through my first uh, couple of, of visits. Um, there was a proper feedback system. It was, um, it was, I mean, I went with Martin Webster. Then I went on my own. It was literally like coming home. They could, people come and pick me up from the airport and it was wonderful. Um, I then also went with Interplast US uh, or it was, it, it was, um, and that was a completely different experience because their main focus is uh, on service rather than on teaching. It is now, now they've changed and there's a lot of their focus that is on teaching. Uh, so with them, I went to South America, to Bolivia and to Mali um, met some people, so I'm still in contact with, which is fantastic. But I could also see that the, you know, there are absolutely amazing surgeons abroad, and sometimes they just need a helping hand, like we all do. Um, and that's why I thought I would try and uh, try and unify the sort of um, diverse efforts in the UK. I got onto the Overseas Interest Group uh, Committee, and uh, it took me some time, but that was when I thought we could do something that we could all stand behind and be united about with some principles, with somewhere to people to go and a focus so that you don't kind of have to start inventing the wheel by yourself and so that you have people to talk to, which is important for the people that also go out. You also have to take care of your own mental health. So you mentioned about going to Ghana and Bolivia, and I'm aware that I believe Mr. Jemek, you also went to Bangladesh. Um, in during those different countries, what was it that you did when you were out there, and at what stage in your training did you go out? So it depends a little bit about what 
the main uh, problem is in that country. So mostly I worked as a general plastic surgeon with a, with a hand surgeon for Bangladesh, definitely for hands, because that's what they wanted. So um, it's different for different places, for sure. Uh, for Mali, it was also a trip with Interplast that was both for a combination of cleft surgery and hand surgery. But you see common problems most commonly. So it's trauma, it's post-burn contractures. And in Bangladesh specifically, they have a lot of electrical burns. So uh, the vast majority of trauma is from burns. Uh, it's a very agricultural country. So that you rely on your hands, uh, obviously, to feed yourself, to feed your family. Uh, and these burns are uh, covered. They are absolutely whizzes with local flaps there is zero I can teach them about that they can probably teach us quite a lot about that but the reconstruction or the animation of a burnt hand which is basically being fritzed by electricity with the tendons and nerves and stuff like that so you have to think you know that plastic surgery is a lot about thinking laterally or hand surgery per se and so therefore you need to combine some methods that you may not have thought about before if the situation is and you know that you can do tendon transfers but can you do them acutely or do you wait until all the soft tissue is um, mature? So you also have to think about what it is that you're sending your patient or our patient out into afterwards. You know, is there availability of uh, therapy? Is there availability? Do you have to keep them in hospital until they're healed and so and so and so? So those are all the things that come together. Um, you've made a, a good point there about um, the, the kind of infrastructure in the countries being very different to um, in the UK. Um, yeah. How what kind of challenges did that bring, and how did you face them in terms of keeping continuity of care or follow up for your patients? So I've been very lucky and gone to places where they have a hospital. There is a unit, and that unit is already interested and engaged into expanding their. Um, remit. So they have uh, money set aside. It may not be uh, as much money or as many resources as you would like to, but they're, they're working towards getting this into a multidisciplinary team. People understand that very quickly. It's not something that, you know, white people have invented for the West. It, it comes naturally. But when you only have one therapist with 500 patients, that therapist is pretty busy and may not be able to do the one to one 45 minutes education for the hand patient that you want to um, so you need to be so this is so you asked me before when I started going out so I personally started going out when I had the the stamp of approval you know the thing that says CCST um, because I thought that's when I could offer something because at that point the only thing you could offer was surgery so I think today we're in a different uh, sphere where you as a trainee can go out and be useful and don't forget that I feel also I have to go out and be useful it's not just for trainees but because there are so many other contact points at uh, our careers that you can be a helpful friend to another person in another country I think that's the essence I also think that it has shown me that for these, for, for my colleagues abroad who've become lifelong friends and, you know, they know my family, I know their family. And uh, this is not, a, this is a relationship that you remember you had with people maybe from primary school, but, you know, I mean, how many family members of your high school or university do you know, or colleagues now, do you know their mom? No? Well, okay. So this is a, a different relationship. But I think that uh, if you, if you want to go out earlier, you're just maybe not doing um, maybe not doing this surgery bit, maybe not doing the teaching bit, but you can teach different things. Like uh, there's been a massive upsurge in uh, in the interest about how to publish, how to do research, and of course you want to do as much research if you live in um, Ethiopia as if you live in Norway, right? You you in for and everybody to for you to expand your uh, your hospitals and your own practice, you need to have numbers, you need to collect data, you need to be able to present it so that you can show that this is important. And so the, the, if you remember the 2015 global surgery, um, um, Lancet and all that, okay, that was numbers, right? That was somebody who actually said, okay, we know that TB and malaria is a massive problem. 
right? But we also have this massive problem that we have chosen to more or less ignore for a long time. So in that respect, you know, knowledge as always is power and numbers is power. So go out whenever you want. Think about how you can, what you can offer the best of yourself uh, if you want to. And, you know, we're all different, good at different things. So if you're good at uh, statistics, that's an amazing gift to have. I'm not. If you're good at surgery or good at teaching, that's also, you need to offer them the respect that you would want for yourself. So let's say that we're, um, that we invite somebody to speak um, from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I'd quite like the chief to come. I'd like the chief to come. I don't mind everybody else coming also, but I want the chief to speak. And so therefore you also want the chief to speak if you go to, I don't know, Dhaka, you, you want to have somebody so that you show the respect that they deserve. But it doesn't mean that the whole team can't be involved and do other things. Does that make any sense at all? No, that really does. And based on that, I, I did want to ask specifically, what was it that you learned so much about, not only from a surgical perspective, but from your experiences whilst you were out there? <sighs> okay. I would say that uh, the most, I had the most important thing uh, is consistency, I suppose. Consistency and um, an openness, um, a willingness to adapt. So the fact that, uh, well, okay, okay, they drive on the right side here. I can't come here and say, well, I'm used to driving on the left side, so I'm gonna drive on the left side. That doesn't work. And you know what? Everything else is the same. So if you go to another country, you're still the guest. You have to adapt to what they have. You can't just as little as you can demand that special little instruments that you know you want, but doesn't really, because by the time they bring it to you in the theater, you've already done that bit of the operation because you didn't wait. You know, that's the same thing abroad. You, you need to go in and open say, okay, so this is what we have. So I need to make do. That's it. So it teaches you to be a better surgeon, I think. Oh, I have to be careful here. But I think it is, um, I think it is not for everyone. Uh, I think just like other things are not for everyone. I am not particularly keen on going somewhere where bullets are flying around my ears and all the earth I'm standing on is not safe. Uh, but I think that we each need to also think that we don't have to do everything, right? I know that the I know that the seven concepts of what you should be as a doctor, as an educator, scholar, all of that. But you know, sometimes just choose the thing that you're really good at. Get really good at it. And you know, nothing is uh, if you get to be a really good microsurgeon or a really really good hand surgeon for congenital hands, like you said, or for trauma, then that's super good. Okay, that's that's the gift that you can give on something that you yourself are really good. Or if you're really good at writing papers, then that is something or really good at organizing things. Fantastic. Is there a particular event or case that you um, remember and sticks in your mind and has kind of changed your practice when you've been uh, practicing in the UK or in Canada? Uh, I have certainly diagnosed uh, atypical TB. Uh, in the UK and in Canada on the basis of having worked in Ghana, for sure. And uh, that was, um, I say, uh, one nil to plastic surgery over microbiology, but there you go. Um, so that was it. I have um, cases which are sad, but the fact that people can do so much with um, so little and that you as a hand surgeon can give them some of that hand function back is not a small thing. Um, it, is a, it is a good thing and it means a lot to that person because then they can perhaps get that job and they can perhaps earn money, then they can perhaps not beg and, you know, be a useful part of society, not that they're not a useful part of society, but you know, for yourself that you're able to do stuff. Owing to the fact that of course we are the Overseas Trainees Committee and a lot of us are interested in global surgery, what would you recommend for any trainee at any stage 
uh, pre and post CCD about getting involved in global overseas work? And do you have any personal advice? Okay, I would, I think that getting in, uh, being in an organization which has some clear guidelines and some governance uh, is key here. I think that a lot of places, uh, well, we know a lot of places, but see you as um, cheap labor, as in sent out, well, we don't have any doctors, and I'm thinking about medical students, you know, who get sent out to be doing um, doctoring work, which they're not really trained for just because it's in a low and middle income country. And you can say, well, it's either them or none, but the act of uh, supervision and the act of safe practice is what we owe to all our patients everywhere in the world. And uh, for that, I, that's a hill I'm gonna die on. Uh, so as a trainee, you get involved with BSSH or B first, uh, whatever you want, uh, go out with them, uh, see where you can contribute. And you know, as you have shown, there is the internet side, there is the uh, writing up of uh, guidelines, there is the having contact with your counterparts, there is going and seeing and making friends with somebody at your level. Imagine how wonderful it would be that you grew up with somebody who, until you're consultants here and there, and then you say, oh, but we've known each other for the last eight years and we, we're great friends and now we really know each other because there, it has to be a friendship because if there isn't a friendship, you're also not going to tell a complete stranger, we have this really thing in our unit and that's not working and how do you think I should solve it, right? That takes courage and it also takes that you trust the other person enough to be able to say that. So I think educate yourself surgically in whatever you want. Become super specialist in brachial plexus, which for me, I must say, was actually a surprise that this was so useful. But I didn't have any experience in Vietnam and Cambodia like we Lam. I didn't think, and I think that you, your, your, um, your opinions, of course, get colored by what you see. So, and the unit you go to will probably also say, well, she's a hand surgeon, so let's show her mostly hands, right? Or, He's a lower limb surgeon. Let's mostly show them him. Uh, let's, let's show these patients to him. But get really, really good. Train in safe environments where you know that even the patient that has complications, which we all have, right, will have a good follow up. So this is not the place where you're going to try and test out new things or get really good at doing brachial plexus uh, because there is a lot of it. You do that at home, right? You, you get really good at the surgical thing at home. And then you go out and teach and practice it. But in between that, there is a lot of other stuff. So get really good. See whether, you know, what did you thought, what, 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 if you get contact, your peers are going to be much more open to you and tell you what they want than to me, right? An SHO in uh, Toronto or in, in Sheffield or in Accra is going to be much more vocal to another SHO. Uh, or a registrar than to a consultant, right? Normal. So contact, contact, contact. Educate, educate, educate yourself, and then you can educate everybody else, including okay. me. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about Be First and just ask you about how did that come about? Um, what have you learned through the experience and how do you maintain an involvement in it okay. in day? day? So I did two things, I have to say, I did two things that I'm proud of in my life. I was B first, and then I also made the BSSH Council give £32,000 a year for the project, which started out in Sierra Leone and is, you know, flourishing. Uh, okay, tenacious, okay, very, very stubborn. I know a lot about how to writing, uh, writing things about um, making a constitution, what are important in that how much negotiation and how much persuasion you initially have to do to make this a good thing. So I have, uh, the ideas have always had some support, but I would not say it has been an, as unanimous as it is uh, now, and that's fantastic. So it just goes to show that you, if you have an idea, stick with it, right? Just, you know, hang on in there. Number one, and if it's the right idea, people will eventually come around to it. Um, so yeah, lots of really, really boring stuff. Um, but you know, it, it's been useful for sure. No, I think that's really inspiring. And I think the last question that we have is, owing to the fact that it's the COVID-19 pandemic, 
How have you been involved in it? Have you been in, involved in any overseas work during the pandemic? And if so, how would you suggest others get involved, particularly with difficulties with traveling at the moment? Okay, yeah. So the so the um, pandemic was like a giant big slap in the face, wasn't it? With everything, you didn't even go outside your front door. You went from from your front door to the hospital front door to the back. Right, that was it. Uh, and had a shower everywhere all the time. Um, but okay, so everything went online. So uh, uh, We Lamb has been uh, really good uh, together with uh, BSSH. So Be First and BSSH have made these amazing webinars, where uh, Sarah Tucker has been helpful in making some other webinars, which are more of a practical ilk. But I think our our main um, uh, our main advantages was that We Lamb did a lot of monthly teaching uh, in a small focus group. Which is which had the uh, which has also had also the idea. So this was a from lots of different countries, but it was a small group. So after a while, people got to know each other and were absolutely free to open up and ask questions. So I think that was really important. The webinars that we now run are run by experts, and they are from experts from the UK and experts from somewhere else. Because I think we need to I think we need to be get away from this that it's only the West and North and West that can teach everybody else. You know, if you, I'm sure that, okay, let, there is a trainee in Ethiopia who uh, the B first sent on a on a microsurgery on a on a flap course for lower limbs because that's a problem for him, uh, and he's done 500 gastro flaps, right? So, you know, they couldn't teach him anything about the gastro flaps because he's done far more than anyone else, but they could teach him about something else. So you need to also take the knowledge that is somewhere else. And may it, because it is relevant and it's also relevant for us, right? So it's not just about teaching other people, but hey, we also like to teach. I also like to learn as well. So as everything's gone online, now we're talking again about going out, uh, you know, more and more people getting vaccinated. It's um, going to be easier to travel again. Um, so let's see. But I think that was, a, that was a good thing that we kept in touch. I've kept in touch with my... Uh, Bangla friends uh, all this time we've had weekly sessions monthly sessions we are you know we're always on whatsapp which is really good you know if you made a if you made a whatsapp group with uh, the trainees in another country right so that you had uh, a, a training whatsapp group where you message that messes each other that's also useful I can imagine that would be something that a lot of us would be interested in. I guess it comes down to how do you get out and meet these trainees when you haven't met them um, prior? I guess perhaps we could utilize our seniors like yourselves who know yeah. them, perhaps put us into contact because I think that's something that's really interesting, actually. Yeah, it's actually not my idea. It's Tim Goodacre's idea. And <laughs> to, to start with, I was where I thought, hmm, really? But he was, but the, the 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 question of buddying also. And B first has that thing where if you when you when they come over here to be um for the fellowships, not over here, obviously, sorry, in the UK, over there, uh, that there is somebody there that you know already and can take you through all those stupid little things that you don't really know when you land in another country. You know where do you get your bus pass? Where do you whatever? Um, but there are lots of you. You being in, in in this situation, there is a lot of people coming on IFSSH now. And what I would suggest is that we make contact that we make you contact with them so that you can help them when they come. Yeah. So it may be I'm not talking about you being travel agents and getting their tickets and, and hotels. You know, they're all adults and are perfectly able to travel all over the world. But there are other things that may be slightly uh, dif different to ask about. Yeah? So you can say and it's also nice to say, right, you even go and get them from the airport. Right. How wonderful it is that you get welcomed, that I come to a conference in a country that I may not may or may not have ever been. And somebody comes and gets me from the airport so I don't have to navigate. And in that time where you get them from the airport to wherever they're staying, you talk, you develop a relationship. You will remember them. They will remember you because in years to come you were there you were welcoming them i think that's, that's really what good i idea. for yeah. ifssh and then there'll be lots of others yeah it's a really good idea there's actually a lot of conferences that are um taking place online and it's allowed lots of people to get to 
know each other. I did a course recently with the Oxford Global Surgery and they also encouraged mm. to get to know each other afterwards as well, which is great. Yeah, that's another thing. So there is a lot of... Um, there is a lot of courses now in global surgery and you can do MSCs, you can do all sorts of things. Um, I think all of that is super helpful. I think there is a lot to learn and this will also open our eyes for that the, you don't, that it's not only going over there, wherever over there is and cutting, but there is lots of other things that you can do. Um, some gives you a degree, some are three weeks old, three weeks long, some are three years long. It depends on what you can and want. I mean, there is always the organic way of, of learning stuff or there is sort of a, a ordered way of doing stuff. Yeah. So, but I hope that this will be, you know, that getting an MSc or in, in global surgery is going to be the same as, you know, having done basic research and whatever, yeah. that we can elevate it to that. Um, that level. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ms. Jemek, for your time and for answering all our questions. Um, and thank you for having me. Your insight. Thank you very well. much. So, thank you.